Uh, so the new handout has an overview to kind of orient you a bit with what word, uh, with, with, with what WP e-commerce did and we'll look at it together. But again it goes into detail about how to install the plugin um, and then number eight is the one to pay attention to because several things were added to your to your site uh, and we'll look at them in detail right now so uh, if we're back in our dashboard here let's look here first starting from top to bottom uh, under the dashboard section there are two subsections let's look at this let's go to dashboard store upgrades dashboard store upgrades so WP Commerce out of the box works really well and it's a kind of a plugin like most are which work on a sort of a freemium model have you heard of the term freemium before it means that pretty much all aspects of it are free but there are some premium aspects that's what we're seeing here store upgrades such as gold cart member access plugin etc so if you want to create members only logins and that sort of thing that is not built into WP commerce you have to pay a little extra for it how much well you can click on the plugin and it'll take you to the screen to tell you um, let's see, it tells me about it, where's the price? $47. $47, right there, so $47. Okay, that's, I assume, a lot of the reason why people go in and give it not five stars, because they want to be able to do everything for free. And I think a lot about today's um, mentality, especially about stuff online, is that it should be either always free or really, really inexpensive. Part of that came from the shift in digital music. Remember buying albums, $15 or more, and then now you can get 99 cents a song. So that shift has gone to a lot of this stuff. Games, uh, growing up playing games, I remember they were 50, 60, 70 dollars. Some of them are still that price, but now there's so many iPhone games, iPad games, uh, Android games that are 99 cents, 299, 599. So, the 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 value of these things is still very high, but the price is very low, and people are starting to equate, you know, value and price. Like even if it's a really good product, why would I pay more than 99 cents? I pay I pay for my music for 99 cents. So I think that's a lot of the reason why when you look at this, 47 dollars for a plugin. It's not even real, you know. I can't download it. I can't hold this, but it's in, it's it could be an integral part of your e-commerce um, platform. And once you, you're making the five hundred dollars a month from your website, well, forty-seven dollars is, is is nothing. But if you need something like this, there's a there's a there's a there's an add-on to this plugin. Gold cart, etc. So anyway, you can look at store upgrades on your own. We're not going to need any of them. That's why I chose this plugin because WooCommerce is very full featured, very powerful, but it needs more plugins. I just want to work with one plugin, see how it works, and then move on. Question. So I see that they offer here the product slider without buying that. Our plugin, the company just download. It have. Well, here's the thing. They have one that they make themselves that they are confident that works on their, on their, uh, on their product page perfectly. But you can find a thousand other product sliders for free. So you can put it on top of this plugin. Yeah. So if you really got a product, a slideshow thing, you can probably use it on top of this one without a problem. This is the one that they sell themselves that, that they know works 100%. All right, so you can explore upgrades on your own. Let's look at this other screen up here, store sales. Empty, but one day that'll be full of stuff. That's what's going to show you um, who bought what and um, their order ID and all of this cool stuff, like to print a shipping label and all of that stuff. <coughs> Ours is empty, but this screen will be the one of the important screens because it's going to 
tell you everything that's been sold. It will itemize it all and allow you to download it. Notice right here, download S, download CSV. This will download all of this data. Once there's data, it'll download it into a universal CSV file, which is like a spreadsheet file, uh, an Excel file, and then you can open it up in QuickBooks or you know any other sort of software like that. But this will give you a list of everything that you've sold. Let's look at home in the dashboard, because as soon as you log in from now on, on the, on the home screen, you're going to have a section here that also, at a glance, gives you WP Commerce data. Sales summary, sales by quarter, sales by month. So this will give you a quick summary. In the current month, how much money have we made? How many orders have we uh, processed? Average order, total income. So as soon as you log in, you'll be able to see that. So when you first log into to your WordPress, you will see the home screen on the dashboard. And what you can do is, you know, rearrange this a little bit. I don't want to see the WP Commerce news. Close that. So then as soon as I log in at the top, I see my sales right away, and then I'm happy. You can close any of these. The first one, WP Commerce News. I see, because then you get right to the sales summary. You can also rearrange these. You can grab any of these modules and put them in other parts of the screen. So let's say I want sales summary at the very top and then sales by quarter to the right of it and then sales by month below that. So Victor, yes. this is the e-commerce modular. It's not meant to be like an accounting system. Right, like a QuickBooks site that's just meant yeah. to promote sales on, on the internet. Exactly. That's uh, that's that's a limitation of it. That if you wanted to hook into your your uh, your your accounting system, uh, we have to do more to get that set up. Uh, so perhaps that's another reason why it doesn't have five stars, uh, because it didn't solve that problem for people. People might already have. Uh, their accounting setup, they add this and it doesn't hook in, and then people get upset. Yes? Does that um, spreadsheet or whatever you call it, um, does it just keep on rolling forever or does it change? Um, does it cut off and do it by month? So see that down on CSV? It's going to just keep adding more records to the database. Uh, to the spreadsheet, that is. And then uh, it gives you the fields for everything, uh, uh, including month and, and everything. So then you can organize it once you download it. But it's just going to keep adding to it. OK, so if you wanted it to cover like six months, mm -hmm. it would just keep on adding? Yeah, so if you downloaded this, it would show you everything from the past 12 months, if you have 12 months of data not just the past six months. So every time you download it, it'll be the whole thing, okay. not since your last download. Okay. Victor, yes. Where you, uh, would you have your customers put in your address and all that? That's the other customer information also? Or you know, you're six to down or? Yeah. So we don't have anything here. Uh, it, it, we don't have anything here, here for me to actually show it to you. But yes, um, this is what it would show this would be a list under customer and there'd be a clickable you click on it and it'll give you the full detail and it'll tell you the customers uh, name their email and their address not their credit card information but the stuff about shipping for example so this is then why now okay we're we're getting into this territory that now we are going to be storing people's sensitive information their home address their phone number etc and at the moment, our site does not have any security. It has the login that we created and that sort of thing, but it doesn't have SSL security, which is the thing that you see when you go to your bank. Um, you know, when you go to any bank nowadays, any secure site, you're going to see that lock. Our site does not have that. In order to get that, that's where you have to pay GoDaddy or Bluehost for SSL. 
secure sockets layer for SSL certificate and then that vouches for your site that it has been verified that it's secure and that helps you to prevent you know data breaches because in the sales log you're gonna have people's personal info not the credit card info but still personal info and again we'll talk about it about SSL a little later but I've been mentioning it here and there throughout the class haven't I See, over here on Amazon, I go to Amazon, I don't see the SSL until I'm ready to check out. But they've all got security. And by default, our site does not. All right, so further going further down, um, we've got a brand new section of products. That was not there before. Um, if you <laughs> click, if you go to, pro, if you hover products and then click products, it's empty, of course. But here's where we're going to be managing together in a bit, creating products. Now, what's cool about the plugin is that you can work with variations. So think about this. Let's say you're selling clothes, men and women's clothes. Okay, and then in women's clothes we have sizes, small, medium, and large. And then um, on a particular shirt design you know we have a shirt that's blue and yellow and another one that's red and blue and another one that has a happy face so three different versions uh, three different sizes for each of those types of shirts those are variations so we have the ability to create variations here uh, we can create uh, <coughs> since this is going to be Victor's Bakery and we're going to deal with baked goods we're going to have uh, we're going to sell donuts let's say and we're going to sell donuts as single donuts, three in a batch, six in a batch, 12 in a batch. They're all donuts, but it's variations because we have different groups of them. We are, have the ability to create coupons. So either a, a fixed amount discounted or percentage discounted and all of that. You have categories and tags like we've seen before for blog posts. So categories are the general overarching organization for our products. Okay, Victor's Bakery. We're going to create, we're going to sell pies. We've got five types of pies. We're going to sell cakes, and we've got five types of cakes. We're going to sell cookies. We've got three types of cookies. Those are the categories. So then inside of pies, then I would say pecan pie, cherry pie, key lime pie. That's what categories are, just like when we were doing our blog posts. I have a blog post on this particular topic and that particular topic, categories. Um, and the different type, for example, pie is a category to rank the subcategories. Say that again. In the different, under pie, that's pie. one of the categories, we have the different types of strawberry, whatever. Yes. So that's another category. Is inside the category too? No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far because uh, let's say, okay, we have categories of pies and we've got cherry pie, but that's a product not a category. A product with variations, because I could sell a 6-inch pie and a 12-inch pie, but they're both cherry pies. Two variations of cherry pie inside of the category of pies. We've got tags, and tags are useful when searching, just like blog posts. I could tag, even if I've got a cherry pie and a pecan pie, they're both pies. So I would tag them both pie, and when someone searches pies, they'll find pies. Let's say I've got, I've got pies and cakes. They're both two separate categories, but they are perfect, you know, um, autumn cakes and pies. So I can tag both of them with autumn, and th therefore when someone searches autumn, they will get a result of that pie and that cake. Can you um, say what the slug is? Well, when we actually start looking at that, I'll explain that, but basically that's the name of it in the address. So autumn will be a category? Autumn will be a tag, like keywords. What are the keywords about that product? This product is gluten-free. This product is um, 
you know, perfect for autumn? You know, what are the keywords that uh, define the particular product if someone is searching? So we'll look at these in detail, but products section is a brand new section that we've got here that wasn't there before, and now it's there because of the plugin. Let's look at pages. We've got some new sections here. New pages, that is. Under pages, we've got products page, checkout page, transactions results page, and your account page. So WP Commerce made these. The products page by default will, will show all of your products. So if I've got 40 products and 20 of them are different, it'll show them all here. Well, I want different pages for different products, just like Amazon. Over at Amazon, I can, uh, I can go here and, and, and browse the department. Only show me movies that are uh, on Blu-ray. So it shows me a page related to movies on Blu-ray. We will be able to do the same thing here, but by default, all of our products will be shown on one page. That's not very useful. Part of the way to create, let's say, a page to show only pecan pies, or only, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, only pies, and only cakes, and only donuts, is to categorize them. Once we've got a category for a product, we can make a page that only shows that category, which is basically what we're seeing in Amazon. There's a page that is only showing Blu-ray products. And again, we'll look through all of these in detail, but there's a checkout page when someone adds a product to the shopping cart. There's a checkout screen. We'll see how that's set up. When someone fully goes through paying for it, they get, they get the end point is a transaction results page that says, thank you for buying our product or whatever we wanted to, to say. If a person chooses to create an account, they will have their own account screen. Again, uh, you have to decide, do you want to be able to let people create an account? You know, it's easy for the consumer to log into their account and then continue to buy their products because their information is already filled in. But do you want to be responsible for that? Do you want a login screen that people could potentially try to break into? With SSL, that helps keep you safer, but you know, there's no such thing as foolproof security. Um, what is also what what you can also think about is sometimes you just want to buy a product. You want to click go to shopping cart, enter my credit card, and done. I don't want to create an account. I don't want to remember what's my password. I don't want to retrieve my account. So you have to decide, do you even want to let people create accounts or not? Uh, and if you do, they will have their own little account screen. And, and that will, this particular program will set up the name and passwords? No, um, the, it, will, it will, I think you can let when a person wants to create an account, I think you can say, make a password for me. But most people will make their own password. Mm -hmm. So a person will be able to put in their name, their email, and a password. And if they forget their password, it regenerates it? It has a system to retrieve passwords. So that all comes in this plugin? The retrieval of passwords is something built into WordPress, but then this, pl th this plugin taps into that. Let's actually look at one of these pages for a moment. Let's open the products page. So click on it or click edit. It's not very impressive, the products page. What's happening here is this is a short code. This is um, one sentence of a, a code that makes something happen because 
not a lot of us want to get into writing code, so depending on the plugin or the theme, they might provide a list of short codes, which is just write this one word and it'll make your shopping cart, instead of us having to make it ourselves. Just write this one code and it'll show you only your pies. Short code. So, okay, well, that's not very impressive. How does it actually look like? Try clicking Preview Changes so that it shows it to you as, a, as your site. Hmm. We might get a fatal error here. Don't worry about that. We don't have any products. Did anyone get some errors here? Okay, don't worry yet, I think. Um, so it's going to be a products page. It's going to load up products from the, from the products screen when we have products. And this is the, this is the uh, awesome top of our theme? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes our theme and then uh, shows the products. So our theme has to be an e-commerce? No. Nope. E nope. Your theme can be any theme, uh, and it'll just, uh, your, your products will be displayed on the screen like how your theme is set up. And you don't know in advance how the theme is going to display those? Not exactly. No. Sort of trial and A little bit, yes. All right, so going down our notes, um, pages, we're going to look at those in detail, but here's where we're going to show some products once we have products. Let's, look, let's continue to look here now. One of the big ones that's important is, well, what um, the nuts and bolts, the guts of the plugin that's found under on the left side, go back to dashboard. We have a brand new section under settings, store. That's new. These are all of the settings of the e-commerce plugin. Let's look at that. Settings, store. So this store settings gives then a bunch of tabs here. We'll go through them and start changing some of these. So I'm not going to add products and make pages and all of that yet. I want to set the foundation of my store first. Doesn't that make sense? Selling products, you know, putting the, putting the cart before the horse. We want to set up our settings first. So let's go here to settings. We're under the general tab, and let's go through these. Base, country, region. Select your primary business location. Okay, well, I'm going to go in here and select USA. This needs to do with uh, taxes and such, and shipping. Oh. <laughs> so our primary business is in uh, the U.S., and then state... California, or if you've got a Delaware limited liability company, put that in. So, so is this for where you're going to do business or where your business is at physically located? What, what state are you? I would recommend uh, check with your, um, with your, what are they called, uh, with your accountant, which of them should you be putting for tax purposes. But I'm going to assume that my business is physically in California, and I'm shipping from California, and I'm paying taxes in California. Even if I'm only doing virtual products, I'm going to select California. Then we've got target markets. Select the markets you are selling products to. If you're selling virtual products, then leave every country turned on. You want to sell to every every country because you will be able to accept currency from every country because PayPal is going to be the one processing the, the funds and they will be able to process every currency. Now, I'm going to say, like, I'm going to sell physical products and I'm only going to ship to the U.S. because it's expensive to ship to Canada or Mexico. So I'm only going to turn on USA. The way I would do that is under Select, click None, 
and then scroll down and turn on USA. So obviously you can put whatever you want here, but I'm only going to select USA for this class. Selling both. Virtual and real products? Hmm. That's a little trickier because if you leave them all on, that gives you the problem that someone from Tuvalu might want to buy your product and have, the, have it shipped to them. So I'd have to think about a good solution for your particular issue. Uh, oftentimes when you need to deal with more than one location, it might behoove you to have two separate uh, WordPress sites, one for one location and one for another. Target market, okay, keep stock in cart for X. So do you, uh, do you ever go to some online shop and then put something in your category, in your shopping cart and say, I really want to buy that, but maybe I should pay the mortgage today? Mm -hmm. So then you come back later after payday, and then uh, and then the product is still in your shopping cart, tempting you. That's what this is right here. How long would the product stay in the person's shopping cart? Right now it says one day, and you can change it to days, hours, or weeks. You put one week. What that does is holds a product. When we talk about inventory, it holds the product uh, for the person. So it removes it from inventory that long. So you have to think about that. If you've only got five of these products that you're going to sell, and you give a whole week for people to make up their minds, you might lose a sale. So it's up to you to decide what makes sense. And notice you can put uh, also uh, fractions, so 0 0.5 hours, or I suppose 0 0.5 weeks, which is uh, three and a half days. Use product hierarchical category. Don't worry about that. But that is saying, how would you like to display your 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 address? Do you really want it to say in deep detail what the product is? If it's inside of a, you know, you've got your product name, and if it's in a subcategory, put it on the address. And if it's inside of a parent category, put it in the address, and then put it on products page. Your address might be a bit too long, not that good for SEO. That's why it's off by default. The default will be that it's got the name of your site, the name of the products page, and then your product. That might really be the deepness that you need. So don't change that, in my opinion. What is the currency, the main currency that we're dealing with, uh, not the New Zealand dollar, so scroll down to USA dollar. If you want to display the dollar, the currency symbol in any other location, for some reason you could. If you want to change the, the separators here, for some reason you could. I didn't change any of that, so we'll click Save. Don't forget to save at the bottom. You can always come back and change these things whenever you want, but it's a good idea to set them early on. <coughs> Let's go look at admin. This screen has a lot of things to fill out, but not that complicated. Max downloads per file. This only applies to people that are selling virtual products. If I'm selling my original MP3, my music, if I'm selling my original novel, PDF, if I'm selling a print of my photo, JPEG, if I'm selling any virtual products, I guess services, maybe, how many of these can be downloaded? Uh, so the thing here is that someone might have downloaded my book, and then um, they had it on their computer, and their computer fell in a lake, and their hard drive got wrecked. They don't have my, my, my book anymore. Are we going to give them only one chance to download it ever? Or maybe two, or maybe three. So again, it depends on, on your 
philosophy and if you are doing a virtual product, how many maximum downloads of the file. Once you've bought it, you know, you, once you've bought it and you've downloaded it three times, what are you doing? Uh, stealing it and giving it to your relatives? Who knows? But it's up to you to decide how many downloads. To be more stringent with, uh, with the, this goes hand in hand about lock IP. This goes in hand, hold, hold in, hand in hand with download. This is saying if you downloaded, if you bought my book on your friend's computer at their house, they have an IP address, they have an internet address, which is different than your IP address at your house. If we say lock download to IP address, yes, we're going to say that book can only be downloaded again from your friend's house. The default is no. Allow me to download that virtual good from any location, which I think is more useful than um, locking it down. Don't worry about MIME types. This is a little bit of internal security, so leave it yes. Store admin email. Very important, and it's not filled in. Who will get the emails whenever a product is sold or re returned or canceled or any of that administrator stuff? Usually these are something, uh, you know, like uh, admin at mycompany.com or whatever, or, you know, um, happycat at hotmail.com, whatever your, your email, wherever you're going to be checking to be administering your your uh, your store. There probably exists a happy cat at Hotmail, so maybe we shouldn't put that in, but uh, anything you want here. So that address will get notifications. Terms and conditions. Even though you don't, you might not see it most of the time when you when you are possibly facing litigation, it's a good thing to have that. Uh, terms and conditions that say, you know, use of our product is as is, we are not liable for misuse of our product, etc., etc. Um, you know, whatever terms and conditions that help cover you in a legal sense. It's empty here because everyone is going to vary, but what you can always do is a search terms and conditions boilerplate. So a generic terms and conditions to get you started. So just do a search on any search engine. Terms and conditions boilerplate or terms and conditions template. And you'll find a variety of templates to get you started read the template. I have not checked any of these. I can't recommend any of them. Uh, but read them and see how restrictive they are, how liberal they are, how useful they are to you. But it is a good idea to fill in that terms and conditions because it's going to cover you. And it's better to have more protection and not use it than less protection and need it. Or a template. You might even be more specific. Terms and conditions boilerplate for e-commerce. Terms and conditions template for e-commerce. Because you might get too many results the previous way. e-commerce privacy terms and conditions policy generator. I have not vetted that link. I like the, the title, but I would have to go in and look at it and really decide if it's for me. Terms and conditions for e-commerce at entrepreneur.com. Lots and lots of results. I'm not going to fill anything out here, but obviously you want to. I'm going to put just a reminder. Remember to fill this in.
customer purchase receipt. You, you know that when you buy something online, you get several emails that tell you where along you are in the process. A receipt that you bought the product, maybe a receipt that the product has shipped, etc. So customer purchase receipt. Where is, the, where is this email coming from? What is the name and what is the message itself? So the from address often is no reply at my company. Or you might have a real address here, right? Admin at victorsbakery.com. If you do something like no reply at your company, uh, you don't need a real address because people are not supposed to reply to that. Uh, you could create an address, you could create a Hotmail account, or, or anything like that, you know, no reply, vicbakery at hotmail.com, whatever, it's up to you. But most of the time, how many of you ever reply to that address that says no reply? <laughs> no one, because it's no reply. So you could create it and maybe deal with the people that reply to that. No, on the receipt, which is the message body right here, I would make a note here that says, four questions and comments, email us here. This is the actual message that is going to people. I'll, I'll look at that in a moment. Who is this coming from? Well, anything we want, we could say something like uh, Victor's Bakery uh, Fulfillment Center. Yeah, my basement. Fulfillment Center. Did I spell that right? Fulfillment? And then the message that is being sent to people is this. Thank you for purchasing with, and notice there's like a, um, a keyword that fills itself in here, shop name. Uh, so it automatically will say the name of your shop, which comes from your setting, your general settings in WordPress. So the name of your shop, which in our case is Victor's Bakery, because it's set under general settings of WordPress. So it fills itself in. Any items to be shipped will be processed as soon as possible. Any items that can be downloaded can be downloaded using the links on this page. So it'll also automatically, if you're, if you're uh, selling digital products, we'll have a link on this email that says download your book here or download your video here. All prices include tax and postage and packaging where applicable. You ordered these items. And then it'll automatically show a little table that displays a list of products that were bought, the total shipping cost, and the total price. You can edit this stuff as per here. Tags that can be used. Purchase ID number. If you want people to know what the purchase number was, the, you know, the, the sale receipt number, the purchase ID, you can display that. If you want to display your shopping cart's name, there it is. A list of products bought, the total price, total shipping, total tax charged, and something called Find Us, which will be edited a little later, where it'll be Find Us on Facebook or Twitter, etc. But we set that elsewhere. So obviously you can edit this as much as you want to say, thank you for purchasing with Victor's Bakery. Um, any products, any items to be shipped, any any baked goods to be shipped will be processed as soon as possible. I'm not going to do any virtual products, so I'm going to remove that part. Any items that can be downloaded can be downloaded. I'm going to remove that. If you were going to, you have to put your link in there. The link will be put for us. This, because it says right here, any item will be downloaded using the link on this page. It'll do it for us. We wouldn't know 
which link to put because this is a standard that gets sent to everyone. Any baked goods to be shipped will be processed as soon as possible. With love. So you can put anything you want here and uh, add to it. I don't, I don't want it to show total shipping, just total price. So here we simply remove that tag with the with the uh, with the percent symbol. So it will automatically display what the total shipping will be. We don't need that, so I'll remove it. It's up to you. That'll list all products bought and the total price of everything they bought. Track. Yeah, for example, in the Texcoco site, that's you buy your products, you buy your food online, but you pick it up. So the receipt doesn't make sense to show shipping because nothing is going to be shipped. Okay. And when, when we filled out that information up at the beginning for the virtual products, so um, mm -hmm. like three downloads and all that stuff, should that like not be filled out then if we're selling uh, physical products? Well, notice we cannot, oh, I guess we can do negative numbers for some reason. Uh, but this doesn't matter. Even if you're not doing, uh, even if you're not doing virtual products, there's no reason not to fill this out. Okay. That is, not, it's not going to be detrimental. There's no way to, you know, we can leave it at zero, but you're right that if this relates to virtual products, then this might contradict it a bit, but the user will not see it or even know about it. Track and trace settings. Note, the tracking subject is the subject for the tracking message email. The tracking message is the message emailed to users when you click email buyer on the sales log. Okay, what this is saying is that if you do sell physical products, I'd like to know, has it been shipped? So people will get an email that says product tracking email, which sounds like spam to me. It should be something like, uh, you know, Victor's Bakery tracking email or Victor's Bakery tracking. info. You know, something that makes sense. This is what will go into people's mailboxes when, it de when it's dealing with tracking and shipping info. And the message that gets sent is, track and trace means you may track the progress of your parcel with our online parcel tracker. Just log into our website and enter the following tracking ID to view the status of your order. And it'll show the track ID. And then the person can log in and plug in that number and it'll show what's the status of the order. Has it been shipped? Has the credit card been declined? Etc. Tags you can use in this email are track ID or shop name. Save changes. Any questions on this screen so far? Is that tough of a new name thing? Setting saved? At the very top? I'll get back to that right here. This is about if you're going to edit your theme, editing the code. But I'll get back to that. Taxes. We'll get back to this. This is a big complicated thing. Mm -hmm. So let's say you want to you want to send some people to another to another site, and you know they're gonna you know they you do you do marketing for them, mm -hmm. so you're sending them to the site. You want to know who goes to their site. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? Uh, Google Analytics. Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. That'll tell you all your traffic. There's also Jetpack 
which we've got which we've got installed but will fully work once we're online that'll give you also a list of all your traffic oh, okay. yes you're only going to be able you're only going to be able to see the data of your own site because you can control it it would be very dishonest to be able to look at other people's traffic so most of these sites don't allow that Google Analytics will not allow me to spy on the traffic of my competitor because I need access to the server to keep track of that. So you'll only be able to track what traffic comes into your site and perhaps where it goes to, but not all of the detail about the other person's site, like what traffic they got from other sources. Any person you want to know, okay, uh, you got 20 people came that I sent you or something. The way you do that. The person that gets the traffic would then have to tell you how many, how much traffic, how many 20 people came to your site. So you'd have to send them, you'd have to have a separate site, and then nope. you would transfer it to their site. Nope. The person that is getting the end result of traffic okay. would have to give you the report about how many tra how much traffic goes to their site, and then tell you about it. You have to trust them. Yeah. <laughs> on that, I mean, what kind of information are we saying? Are you just saying a, a numbers count? How many people hit that click? Or are you saying identification? Everything. Google Analytics will tell you the person's web browser, their country, <laughs> the language on their web browser, how long they stayed on your site, okay. what page they might have come from to get to your page. Did they come from Twitter or from Google search? Etc. So Google Analytics is very powerful. And uh, next month, I believe, uh, I'll be starting a new class called Google for Advanced Users. And we'll be talking about some of that. What is the data that Google has? So under taxes, I'm going to get back to this later because there's a lot of nuances we need to talk about. Shipping is the same thing. I'll talk about it later. But these are the things, again, that because you're your own entrepreneur, you're going to need to deal with what are my shipping rates? So I'll get back to taxes and shipping later. Payments. Um, I'll explain it now, but then to fully set it up, we'll need more time. Under payments, we've got a few ways to collect payments. Activate the payment gateway or gateways that you want to make available for your customers by selecting them below. So what this does is who is the middleman that is going to collect the money for me? Because there's always a middleman. Uh, a, a, a customer has their credit card and they want to pay you $10 for something. The money does not go directly into your bank account. Someone in the middle has to process it to vouch that, yes, they do have $10 <coughs> in their account to give you, not just because you trust them. So the one in the middle, in our case, we have these options built in, ChronoPay, and a few versions of PayPal, and a test gateway, just to see if it's all working. No payments will be collected. Now notice this doesn't list a bunch of other types of popular methods, such as authorize.net and other things. So to be able to, to collect payments in those other ways, that's where that gold cart upgrade comes in. That's that extra 47 or $50 or whatever to be able to collect payment in a different way. We're going to be using the PayPal, and I always forget which one it is, either Express or Payments. I'll remember as soon as we do it. But um, we're going to use PayPal because PayPal is free. You can create the account, and we'll be able to plug it in here and start collecting payments. Question? How does that differ from, um, because I've never seen an Express checkout Mm -hmm. 
It can be like both. Uh, looking at the settings, it reminded me which is which. Uh, the Express Checkout is more like the one that you can stay <laughs> on your site and do all the payment processing. And Standard is the one where it'll take you over to PayPal for a moment. Their security. People fill it out there, and then PayPal brings you back to our site. So we're going to go with the standard one because PayPal is going to be then putting the might of their security behind the payment processing. If we choose Express Checkout, we need to handle all of that, and we will be handling credit cards, and I don't want to handle people's credit cards. So PayPal Express is the one that will allow you to use your own site's design to collect payments. But I think that's too much of a high bar when it comes to credit card security. So we're going to use Payment Standard, which will allow people to pop over to a PayPal secure screen, do their payment, back to our site. We never saw the credit card. We're safe. And we'll talk about creating the PayPal account, because there's personal and there's business, and how much does it cost, and and is it worth it and all of that and we'll talk about it in detail but in short uh, yes there's always a middleman and there's always some transaction fee and these range between I don't know 1% to 5% per transaction uh, PayPal the one we're gonna look at I believe is about 2.3% or so maybe 2.5 something like that so out of every payment that, that every product that you sell, PayPal will take a little bit of it. So quick math here. Let's say I'm selling a product that costs $1,948. Well, how much does uh, PayPal take out of that? Uh, we're going to say 2.35%. PayPal would, pay 40, would take $45 out of that, $46. So that could add up. But if you're already selling a $2,000 product, that's not a lot of money. And that's not a lot of money to pay for the... Uh, for the security that PayPal is giving you. Now, Authorize.net might charge 1%. That's fine. Use Authorize.net. But notice we, it, it's an add-on to our plugin. Maybe another $40, $50. Not so bad. I turn that on, I use Authorize.net, and I'm only charged 1%. That's fine. But there's so many ways to skin the digital cat, and this is one of them. So we're going to use PayPal because it's one of the most accessible. Maybe a company charges you no percentage for your transaction fee, but they charge you $1,000 a year to use it, or a month. There's a lot of solutions for this, for the payment gateway. So, so one of the things isn't, on, isn't displayed here. Can you add if you're using something else? Or yeah, and that's, that? yes, and that's going to be under the store upgrades, the gold cart. Let's take a quick look at it. Um, it supports Authorize.net, PayStation, SagePay, <laughs> BluePay, Virtual Merchant, etc. Forty-seven dollars. All of those. Yeah, all of these features are included if you get the gold card. <coughs> Use PayPal. PayPal is like the number one that we for for most consumers, and uh, the thing is, you will not you your users will not need to have a PayPal account. They can just put in their credit card and pay. That's it. And then PayPal will say, "Would you like to create a profile here to make this speedier next time?" And people can say yes or no, and then PayPal will then set up that for you again with their security. But a person does not need a PayPal account to buy any of our products. <coughs> so I didn't change anything here. We're not going to change anything yet. We're going to get back to payments at, a, at, a, at another point once we set up our payment gateway. Uh, we'll go to the checkout screen. Force user registration. Users can check out without a user account, or users must register before checking out. Now, in the world of computers and e-commerce and such, you often hear the term friction. 
friction is a means basically uh, anything that is detrimental for the user to get their results. What that means is, how easy is it for someone to buy your product? The harder it is, the more friction, the more probability that a person will give up and go back to Amazon or elsewhere. So one way to reduce friction is here. Users do not need to create an account to buy your product. It's going to annoy me that I want that product and I click add to cart and it says, okay, create an account. And then I have to verify my account and put in an email and all of that and then I'm already gone to another merchant. If you do force people to create an account, that's up to you, no problem, just turn it on here. The thing though is, if users must register, you must also turn on membership, anyone can register, from within WordPress General. So this could be a catch-22. If we turn this on and click Save, people need to register. We do not have the ability for people to register currently active. So people will never be able to register and buy your product. So what I'm saying is, if you turn this on, make a note that you also need to go back to the general WordPress settings and turn on anyone can register. So When you turn that on, people will be able to register and buy your product. If you turn on one but not this one, people will never be able to register and you'll never sell a product. Catch-22. One at a time. One, one at a time, yes. That's on the settings screen in general. Question? You can turn it on. I'm not going to because I'm not going to force people to register. Exactly. You don't have to. Force you can turn this on and then not force people and then let people register for your site for some reason to create an account. Yeah, it's optional, and then people don't have to create an account, so it'll be optional. So I'm going to leave this. Users can check out without a user account. Same shipping, same as billing. I'm not sure why this one is on like this. I always recommend people to change this one. Turn on Enable. What this is doing is, you've probably experienced this in the real world, you're buying a product and it asks you for your billing address and shipping address. You fill in your billing address and then you can fill in your shipping address differently. Most of us don't. And then there's a button that says, use the same shipping address for my billing address. That's what we just enabled here. By default, we're forcing people to fill in again the exact same information, potentially. Creating friction. People are going to get annoyed. I want to buy this product and I've got to fill in two things, the exact same thing, twice. So I would recommend enable that. People will then have a little button that you turn on and it'll take their billing info and put it into shipping, or vice versa. Same as billing checkbox. Yeah. Security and encryption, by default, allow site to be used insecurely and unencrypted. And obviously, I would want to turn on force users to use SSL, but we have not bought the SSL certificate. That's an extra $60 to $80 a year. So if I turn this on, it'll probably break your site because it'll want to direct people to your address, your secure address which is HTTPS, your address. Notice this. I went to this bank with a plain old HTTP address, and then it directed me to HTTPS, HTTP secure, HTTPS, because they have a security certificate. If a person tries to go to my website, and I've turned on this option here, It'll try to take me to HTTPS, which doesn't exist because I never bought the security certificate. So eventually we want to turn this on once we pony up for the security. 
And this makes it sound more tragic than it is. Yeah, insecurely and unencrypted. That's true. But PayPal is the one that's going to be the secure and encrypted one to access to access the um, credit card info. So you don't have to use it if you're not going to use it. You don't have to use it. I recommend it though, eventually, because you are going to be collecting customers' home addresses and such. And I'm gonna be I'm gonna feel more safe whenever I see that lock when I'm putting any any of that deep any of that info. Well it's not a it's not a plugin. It's that you have to go to Bluehost or GoDaddy and buy SSL there. And then that works for all your websites? It works for the website that you bought it for. So if I've got victorsbakery.com, every page of that website will have the security. But if I have, you know, famous original victorsbakery.com, that's a different website. So it wouldn't have the security. That's the point of all of these, that they're much more stringent. You're paying this amount of money every year to verify that that site is the site that it claims to be. And then here, um, we won't really need to deal with it, but we have the option, once we actually look at it, what, do the, what does a person see when they're going to buy a product? I'm going to show you the example for Texcoco. When you uh, order online, let's say we're going to get... Oops, not LA when we're going to get a um, we're going to buy a product let's say we're going to get a class set of queso tacos mushroom go to checkout here's the checkout screen so how many products am I buying, etc. $97. This is what is asking to be for people to fill in. Uh, we can edit the fields, but the default billing and contact details and such. We want to capture people's name, zip code, this one they have a rewards card number, etc. That's what this screen is here. It's going to say, your billing or contact details. You can make that say whatever you want. First name, last name, address. Which of these are you going to display? Which of them are mandatory? You can reorganize them, simply dragging and dropping. And then the shipping section. You can add or remove more fields. That's what we've got here. We've added a field for rewards card. So we'd be adding a new field and saying that it's a text field or a number field or an address field or, or whatever. How do you, how do you, add? you have an add symbol on the right side. Add a new item? A new field? A new field? You click the plus symbol. So, for example, I have first and last name which would be a parent who's doing the billing, but I want to also can I get rid of the child who's going to be the one that picks this thing up. So where, how would I add the child's name? So let's say above address, you can click the plus symbol there, and then that creates a new field, and then you could say child's name. And is it going to be text or a text area, which is like a larger block of area to type? Is it a heading, a select box, radio, checkbox, etc.? You can put it, you can just drag it to different areas, make it visible and mandatory. Yes, they need to fill in child's name or no. And then you can remove it minus. What's the a text is only going to be one line, oh, and then a, a text area is multiple lines. So I'm not going to change anything here. 
And notice you can add more than one form. So you could use this checkout form for these particular products, create a new form for other products. Uh, you can make it as complicated as you want. This one is asking for, for, for billing and shipping information. You can just ask for, for, for billing info and, and hide all of the shipping stuff. You just go to the column of display and turn those off. So I'm not going to change anything in the form. But what I did do was enable same as billing. And then I'll save. So any general questions on checkout? You can customize it as much as you want. So uh, let's go to marketing, marketing tab. So here's some stuff about upselling and and social media marketing to your to your users because nowadays um, it's not enough to have. Uh, just just your website. You want to have some social media. You also want to get analytics, which is data. You want to learn where did people find out about your site and other things, such as um, here, marketing settings. Users who bought this also bought. You can turn that on and then it'll suggest to people, well, a lot of people, once they buy a pecan pie, eventually they also buy a lemon meringue pie. So they'll get a notice there that maybe you want to buy that too. That might be useful, so I'll turn that on. <coughs> share this social bookmark. This will add the ability to share your items. So if you, if your users find that one of a kind, handmade pottery that you that you sell, and you want other people to know about it, you can turn that on to let people share on Facebook, and then could drive more traffic back to you. Now I've found that this could conflict a little bit with the other sharing options like the ones built into WordPress. Nowadays WordPress offers a share feature built in which is really nice and I've found that you're gonna get two rows of share icons the one from WordPress and the one from this plugin so I don't recommend to turn this one on because the WordPress ones are a little better. how customers found us serving. Add the how did you find us about us drop down option at checkout. This will be a one question survey <coughs> at the at the end of your checkout that says, you know, how did you find out about us? And we'll be able to uh, somewhere over here select well TV, radio, Twitter, etc. I'm going to turn it on so we can see how it looks later. People can ignore it and they'll be fine. There's the ability to like the page on Facebook, which again, I think conflicts a little bit with the other share feature built into WordPress, so I won't turn it on. Don't worry about RSS address, no one really needs that anymore. This Google Merchant Center is also a little bit out of our scope at the moment. Honestly, I haven't worked with it really to give you an answer what that is and what how it benefits you. So I'm going to skip that, Google Merchant. Then we've got a section, Google Analytics e-commerce tracking. This is very useful, but we won't be able to set it up, which is this will tell you all of that detail that I mentioned about who visited my site, on what day of the week, from what web browser and what page did they come from? That's Google Analytics. That's out of the scope of this class, but I talk about it in my in my in my SEO class, and I talk about it in my advanced Google class, which I'll mention either at the end of the day or at the end of the class. It starts next month. We can't really turn this on and use it, so we won't. But it is something useful to activate because knowledge is power. You'll know who's coming from where. You'll know what links came to your site. If you know that, then uh, you're able to 
create you know marketing campaigns you're able to charge advertisers to show that I've got all of this traffic coming to my site is this just for the products page or is this for the whole site this one is specifically just for the products page but we are able to also do something like this for the whole site Exactly. I found that it's not necessary to enable for either your whole site and your shopping cart because analytics will tell you everything. But if you only set it to to the shopping cart, you might not need to do it for your whole site. I would do it for the whole site. Yeah, even if you have one product because you want to know where is your traffic coming from and how long are people staying on your site. This one also tell you who comes from and also buy your stuff, right? Not who buys your... No, where does it come from? They will come from. Mm -hmm. And this one tell you if they bought, if they bought the, the product. No, no, again, this won't tell you if they bought your product. It'll just tell you if they came to your product. It'll tell you who bought your product up on the dashboard store sales. Yes. So does it all when uh, we say um, Google Analytics tracking agency will be the idea that we create you know, the other class? Mm -hmm. for one for every, it's different for every website. Yes, but a different tracking ID for every website. Um, okay, so I made it. I made a change here, remember to save. We'll look briefly at the import screen, although this could be a very useful screen. Um, this is always the challenge to doing e-commerce. Let's say you were you previously were selling products on uh, Squarespace and they offer built-in e-commerce feature but then it was too expensive because it's a monthly fee I don't know you decide I want to do it myself I want to reap more of the uh, of the rewards I don't want to pay other sites to do my e-commerce I'll do it myself well all of your products are in a different type of database they're in the Squarespace database and here we're using the WP e-commerce plugin which is its own database so we want to bring your product from another e-commerce solution to this e-commerce solution the hardest way to do that is product by product copy one product from your other site paste it to this one copy from the other paste it to this one uh, uh, another solution is to import your products but the problem here is what you are importing has to be formatted in a very specific way. And I've experienced this. This is a huge pain to transfer your existing product database from one system to another because every system thinks they're doing it the right way. And then when you go to another system, it's the wrong way. So basically, you can import a CSV file, which is a spreadsheet that has a list of all of your products and product IDs and prices and descriptions and everything that makes up what your product is. You have to import it in a specific way. Um, it has to be imported this way. Your spreadsheet has to have a column of product name, then description, then additional description. Even if your product needs no additional description, it needs that column, but the column will be empty the price of the product, a SKU number, a weight, a weight of the unit, I don't know the difference, a stock quantity, a stock quantity limit. <coughs> so if you've already got existing products that you want to get into this plugin, <coughs> it might be a big hassle. And I know I've experienced this going from uh, this this company that I did health supplements for they had their 
product database. I don't even remember what the original one was. And then we moved over to Business Catalyst, which I really like, but is expensive. And they needed to import all of their products into the Business Catalyst. And theirs said, make sure you've got product name first, and then description. There was no additional description. And then price, there was no SKU. And then this, and then this, and then that. And so we had to take this database <coughs> of like um, 100 products and make sure that everything was lined up in the exact columns because this is going to expect this these columns in this order and even if you don't need a column you need a column for it that it has to be empty so we have to spend several hours I don't remember how long to set up their product database to reflect the database that would be used on Business Catalyst what about if uh, you have a if there's an extra field that is not here, uh, then we don't use it, uh, I guess. So you probably have to go through some kind of database code like the Excel or something to Yes. Let me answer your question in a moment. But yes, uh, finishing your question, that yeah, if you need extra fields, uh, that might be problematic. That might be a possible reason why this solution might not be your solution. With WooCommerce, perhaps we can create more fields, but this is these are the fields that every product needs in this plugin. So to edit your your file, uh, a CSV file is a kind of a spreadsheet. So yeah, you just open it up in Excel. You make you move every you cut and paste every column into the right place, the right order. Save it as CSV and then upload it here, and then it should import all your products into your products category. And it shows you the example right here. Banana, which is the first field, product name. Description, the yellow fruit. Additional description, contains potassium. The price, 67 cents. Um, there's banana, 150G, zero. Uh, banana, where is banana being put? Oh yeah, skew. Yeah, uh, which is, I forget what it stands for, but it's a product identifier. It can be the name of a product, a word, or, or a number. It could be, you know, BN01. So you, you set your own school, school yeah. whatever, and, you know, and there's no standard. Right? There's no standard. Yeah, there's no standard. You can, you can set your own. So, like, uh, looking at my phone, mine has something down here, you know, SKU0168. So there's, there's no standard. You could call this, you know, produce 001. It's fine. So banana is the skew. Its weight is 150. Well, what's the unit? Grams. But some product come with barcodes. Then you can link it to skew? Or That's more... Universal? Barcodes and such are more complicated because that relies on an inventory. So I don't know if you can link it. That's a good question. And that's what the problem is about doing your own inventory and shopping carts, and now you have to track all of that. Uh, then we've got stock quantity and stock quantity limit. Now we'll see later on that we can have we can have stock inventory. We can have we've got five of these to sell, so we put that product uh, with a stock quantity of five. And the plugin will automatically decrease it as people buy it or put it in their shopping cart. So then when they get to zero, no more products, and then the product gets removed from the from the from the store. That's nice. Um, the opposite is if you want if if you can always provide that product, if you can always make new products or unlimited quantity, we put zero, which you know, it's counterintuitive. Putting zero means if we physically put zero, that means we have infinite products. But if we put five and it runs down to zero, now there's zero products. We'll see that in action later. But that's what is written here. We have unlimited stock. Zero. What's the limit of, of, of possible inventory? It's empty. In quotes, it's empty. They didn't put a limit, but we need that field because the database 
import will not work without all fields. And then another example, that one even has uh, an HTML link. All right, so we won't need to do that in this class. We're going to make products ourselves. But if you already got products to import, you might be in for a little difficulty because it takes time to set this up. Presentation screen. So I didn't change anything on import. Presentation screen, we'll look at it right after the break because there's a lot to look in here. Um, we'll, okay. we'll take a break in just a moment. But any general questions so far? Yes. Um, in the importing database, so this data that we're importing is going to be saved, let's see, in our example to WP form database. It's going to be added to it automatically. Yes. So when we do the duplicator plugin, it's already saved. Okay. If I want to access it straight to the database, I have to go to my file. You have to go where or for what reason do you want to access it? Let's see that it's a couple of fields that are not there and I want to add them manually. You will have to go into PHP My Admin yes. and then go to the, 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 the field, uh, the, the table in there. That's called WPSC products. After I do the import, I can do that. Yes. And then, I can add data. then you can you can make new fields and such. Yeah, but you'll have to get into the database. All right, so it's about eleven thirty. Let's take a ten minute break. We'll be back at eleven forty, and then we'll look at the presentation screen.